Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the webinar discussion. Uh, the title today is Violence on the Border, the case of pushbacks in the Aegean Sea. Um, today our panelists will be Lorraine Leap from Legal Centre Lesbos and Christina Carvuni, who is with Community Peacemaker Teams, uh, the Aegean Migrant Solidarity Team. So if you want to feel free to put your name in the chat and where you're joining from so that we know where you're joining us from, that would be great. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm with the Aegean Migrant Solidarity Team with Community Peacemaker Teams. And I'm joining you from Lesbos Island, which is in Greece. Um, before I turn it over to the speakers, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll be dedicating time at the end of the webinar for questions. So if you have any questions, there should be a Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. So feel free to put your questions in there. Um, and if there's anything that we don't get the chance to answer live, we will try to answer it by email. Um, I just want to give you a brief overview of CPT for anybody who's new to us today. Uh, CPT builds partnerships to transform violence and oppression in situations of conflict. Uh, at the invitation of local peacemaking communities, CPT provides physical accompaniment, advocacy, human rights observation and reporting and solidarity networking. Um, I will be moderating today. Uh, my name is Ryan. I've been living in Lesbos since 2017. Uh, first working in PICPA camp, which was where CPT also had a presence for many years. Uh, and since 2019, I've been working with community peacemaker teams. Um, so I think that's everything. I'll pass it over to Christina to introduce us to the topic. Well, hello also from me. Um, I see some familiar faces and some others that uh, I don't know. I'm happy about it. Uh, today, um, we are going to speak about pushbacks. And I will have a small introduction to this uh, topic before I give the floor to the main speaker, Lorraine Litter. Uh, so somehow let's start. Pushback as a term that refers to a set of measurements by which refugees and migrants are forced back over a border, generally immediately after they cross it without consideration of their individual circumstances and without any possibility for apply for asylum. Apparently, pushbacks violate the prohibition of collective expulsion of aliens in Protocol 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights and often violate the international law prohibition on non refoulement Now, the phenomenon of pushbacks, it's not that new, at least not in the Aegean Sea. For example, one of the central actions in No Border Camp in 2009 in Lesbos uh, was to open up this issue for illegal repat repatriation. At that time, the pushbacks were done in a different way. And this way was that the vessels of the Coast Guard were moved in such way to create sea waves so the migrant boats uh, would change the direction and they will end up in Turkish waters. According to Amnesty International 2008 report, start of quotation, violations against migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers continue to be recorded at the borders of Greece. Protection of refugees remain minimal. In October, the German NGO ProAsyl and the Greek Lawyers Group for Refugees and Migrant Rights published a report on the situation on the refugees and migrants arrived by sea. The report denounced systematic violations by members of the Greek security forces involving both ill treatment and denial of access to asylum procedures. These violations they are consistent, were consistent 
with the complaints received by Amnesty International throughout the year. There were frequent complaints about people attempting to enter Greece by sea, many of whom were drowned in the attempt or prevent by the members of the Coast Guard. Those who managed to reach land were usually returned to their country of origin without legal assistance, access to asylum procedure or individual examination of their case, end of quotation. In the previous years, the operation of pushbacks did occur, but they were more sporadic in nature. Since March 2020, with the crisis at the Greek-Turkish borders, it has become the main tool of the Greek state in management of migration. This will become more clear from the following graphs and arrivals that uh, Lorraine will speak about. Despite the deaths, missing migrants, and despite complaints from organizations, the European Union reaction remains weak. The Greek government, in turn, when accused of the murderous and illegal practice of pushbacks, replies that these accusations are product of fake news and Turkish propaganda, reiterating that Greece protects its borders and Europe's borders with respect for human rights. So this mass scale operation of pushbacks was made possible through several processes. Some key points, and I mentioned three uh, here is one, the criminalization of migration, both through legal procedures and socially. For example, several trials against people that cross the borders with accusations of smuggling. And many of them we have monitored as uh, AMS team, uh, and we will continue to do this. Uh, second, the criminalization of solidarity by institutions and organizations that they are not directly or in a relationship of dependence with Greek state, meaning organizations and individuals uh, active in rescue are facing very serious charges like trafficking, espionage, etc., from the Greek state. An example of this situation is the trial of ERCI and others, which we attend again as AMS team in November 2021. So, in this situation, the fear of accusations imprisonment and trials, they can take uh, trials that they can take years to take actual place. Uh, cause um, many rescue organizations to withdraw from the sea and the coast. These kinds of trials, even when the individuals themselves want to be in the court in order to prove their innocence, in Greek courts delay the proceedings keeping the accused in an unfortunate state of hostage taking somehow. After this witch hunt, the sea passage has left without any witnesses to testify the murderous practices of the Coast Guard and Frontex. The third reason is that the Greek government goes ahead with these racist and murderous practices of pushbacks because it doesn't meet any serious resistance from everyone, from anyone, sorry. The European Union, despite continuous denunciation, has not taken action according to the seriousness of the situation. At the same time, much of the local communities on the islands, they are silently welcoming the pushbacks as they see the population of migrants on the islands reducing and also their daily life returning to pre-2015 levels. In turn, looking ways to take a stand in all that is happening around us, we choose to talk about pushbacks also today as a contribution into this struggle somehow, hoping that in the future we will find allies and solidarity in any effort to stop this murderous practice at the border. So we invite Lorraine Litte, a representative of Legal Center Lesbos, in an attempt to strengthen those voices against the pushbacks. Good evening, good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining from. Um, so I will start a slideshow presentation um, in a moment, but just to 
in means of a, a small introduction, um, I'm working with the Legal Center Lesvos, which is an organization that has been operating in Lesvos the last uh, five, uh, five and a half years since the implementation of the EU-Turkey uh, deal, which, which I will get to shortly, um, providing legal assistance to migrants who arrive here by sea from Turkey and documenting and advocating against uh, rights violations that we document here. Um, in the past two years, we have focused our work on monitoring uh, the pushbacks that Christina mentioned and also in, in litigating and advocating against, against this practice. Um, I will turn now to the slideshow, but first I need to share my screen. Just one moment. Mm. Okay, so I want to give a bit of background information before going into um, what we've documented in the past two years in terms of escalation um, of, of the pushbacks in the Aegean region. Um, looking, uh, uh, scaling out a bit to look at the geopolitical factors and the paths of migration from Northern Africa, the African continent and the Middle East to Europe. Um, Greece um, has, has always been a, a place of migration, um, and especially since 2015, uh, when there was mass displacement uh, in Syria, it's, uh, the Greek islands have become a main point of entry um, to Europe. So you can see here in this next slide, the, the main points of entry from Turkey to Greece, um, along the coast of Turkey, uh, the circled islands all um, belong to Greece. So this is a main point of entry for people trying to, to arrive to, to Europe. Um, and until the EU-Turkey statement, uh, for the most part, people were free to move on um, with some exceptions, of course, um, which we don't have time to get into today. Um, but after the EU-Turkey statement, um, we saw the islands become a place of detention. Um, Lesbos, you can see here, the largest of, of the islands along the Turkish coast um, and where we are located. Um, I will go through very briefly, and of course, if there's more questions, we can get into this more in the question and answer period. But since um, the EU-Turkey statement, there's been a gradual erosion of, of rights of asylum seekers and migrants who are arriving here. Um, I think it's important to, to, to talk about this when we talk about pushbacks, because pushbacks are not happening in isolation. They're happening as part of broader um, policies of maintaining the borders, of excluding uh, people from, from reaching where they want to reach, um, and uh, part of an overall deterrence policy uh, to, to stop people from coming to Europe, from, from the global south for the most part. So in April of 2016, after the EU-Turkey statement, Greece implemented into domestic law, um, a, a new asylum law, which essentially um, was, was intending to, to uh, put into practice the aims of the EU-Turkey deal. So the main changes that we saw in, in Greece and in Lesbos was that the islands um, became um, the, the people who arrived to these islands were contained here. They could no longer continue their journeys. So in effect, people were detained here in the islands until they finished their asylum procedure with the intention that then anyone who is not eligible for asylum in Europe would be returned to Greece. Um, and with this was also the um, initiation of, of the concept that Turkey was a safe third country. So this is the start of the externalization procedures, which tries to, to force people to, to seek asylum, to get residency in countries that they pass through rather than, rather than in Europe. Um, in September, 2017, we saw this confirmed by the highest administrative court in, in Greece, uh, confirming that Turkey was a safe third country for two Syrians whose case had been appealed there. Until January of 2020, um, there were two uh, main exceptions uh, of, of ways which people could get around this um, containment policy. One was to show that they were, they were vulnerable, um, meeting a category of, of, of vulnerability, vulnerability defined by 
uh, Greek law, which would allow them to get out of the border procedures and continue to mainland Greece. Um, and additionally, there was a general decision by the asylum service that Turkey was not in fact a safe third country for all uh, nationals, except for those from Syria. Um, in January of 2020, the asylum law was again uh, revised with several uh, procedural um, changes limiting, um, limiting access to procedural rights on appeal, which we won't get into. What one major change was also eliminating this exception for those who are vulnerable. In effect, that meant that everyone was detained on the island until their asylum procedures finished, and there was no way to get off the island, even if uh, showing vulnerability. March of 2020, which is when we saw major changes in both uh, policies and practices, uh, was, as Christina mentioned, uh, uh, in a crisis at the borders and in international relations between Turkey and Greece, where uh, we saw the suspension of the right to seek asylum, which was in place for one month, and the effective closure of the border with Turkey, um, with the excuse of the pandemic, which, which has continued to this day in terms of an effective end to official deportations from Greece to Turkey. Uh, rights of asylum seekers have been uh, uh, successively limited further in, in June of last year, when uh, there was a joint ministerial decision by the Ministry of Migration declaring that Turkey was safe for nationals of the, of the countries from which the highest number of migrants are arriving in Greece. Again, showing that this was a political basis for this rather than any changed circumstances for these people in, in Turkey. Um, so what have we seen over the past years? Essentially on the islands, as many of you probably have followed, um, lack of access to every basic necessity on the island. This was uh, the notorious Moria camp um, at its highest uh, capacity in April of 2020. Of course, um, as most of you know, it was then burned down in September of the same year. Uh, so in sum, and I know this has been <laughs> quite uh, quick um, and we didn't have time to get into a lot of the details, but essentially what we've, we've seen here is that asylum procedures have uh, gradually uh, been um, uh, amended to limit rights to access the procedure with the overall uh, result of more people being rejected and more people being subject to deportation. Combined with uh, terrible living conditions, um, which can only be explained as uh, part of a deterrence policy rather than lack of funds, lack of capacity, um, because we've seen how much money is actually coming to the Greek islands and to the Greek government and to all the organizations working here. Um, just very briefly, um, because I think it's important to mention this, uh, what has happened over the last two years in conjunction with the pushbacks, um, it has been the effective detention of asylum seekers, not only in Lesbos, but across Greece. Um, so under uh, the excuse of the pandemic, we've seen that the refugee camps have slowly become more and more closed uh, centers and detention centers with restrictions on exit, uh, discriminatory curfews, and an increase in policing of migrants, both inside and outside of the camp. So now getting to our main topic, um, the, I wanted to go through the aggressive border policies um, at, at sea and how we've seen this play out um, in the last years, especially since March of 2020. Um, again, we're here in Lesbos. These are the major actors at sea, uh, which, um, as you can see, civil society organizations are no longer free to operate here because of uh, progressive limitation of their operations. Um, but it's uh, in a very narrow strait of uh, water. There are many operators, including from Frontex, including from NATO um, and the Turkish Coast Guard as well. Um, since 2016 with the EU-Turkey statement, um, there has been increased uh, militarization of the border with uh, a large amount of money going to Turkey um, and to Frontex to police the border. And what we've seen um, is that there's been a dr drastic decrease in arrivals. You can see in the top graph um, that after the EU-Turkey statement in March of 2016, 
the arrivals dropped considerably. Um, but then if you look further and zoom in on what happened after the EU-Turkey deal, you can also see a drastic uh, decrease um, in March of 2020 um, after the, the um, crisis between uh, Turkey and Greece, the closure of the borders and increase, um, increase restrictions on movement um, under the guise of um, the pandemic, uh, but also when we started to document the increased use of pushbacks at sea. Um, and you can, if you further zoom in, you can see that it, March of 2020 is essentially when arrivals really dropped off and continue to this day to be uh, very few. Um, so on the, in this border region, this very narrow uh, strait of, of sea, um, it's not only the Greek Coast Guard who is preventing people from crossing, of course, the Turkish Coast Guard as well. And since 2000, since uh, before even 2016, or oh, I focus on that because that's when I also came to the island, um, the Turkish Coast, Coast Guard with funds from the EU has been preventing people from, from crossing and apprehending people at sea and bringing them back to Turkey. And then the Greek Coast Guard uh, in collaboration, as we've seen, and I will get to some examples, uh, with Frontex and NATO vessels has been involved in pushing people back at sea. Um, we've, I, can, uh, I think Nefeli has shared some links in, in the chat. Um, we've published consistently about this. Um, and also have argued that the, what we are witnessing here in the Aegean amounts to a crime against humanity, which um, in international law is a systematic or widespread attack against, um, against uh, a civilian population, which uh, we have no other way to explain, explain this that is happening in the Aegean. Um, I will try to show up a couple of videos, which hopefully this will come through of examples of pushbacks that are happening at sea. So these are when migrant boats are apprehended and attacked by Frontex and Greek Coast Guard uh, vessels. You can see here behind this is a Romanian Frontex boat with a migrant boat beside it. And they essentially do not allow the migrant boat to pass. This boat was eventually returned to Turkish waters and the people were taken on board by the Turkish Coast Guard and returned to Turkey. And I will get into this later why this footage is so rare, um, because part of the practice of pushbacks is that often uh, people's uh, mobile telephones are, are stolen when the pushbacks are, are carried out, which prevents people from keeping evidence and, and documenting what is, being what is happening to them. One other example. where you can see more clearly the Greek Coast Guard shooting into the water and attacking the migrant boat. There have also been cases of the Coast Guard uh, damaging the boats, further putting people's lives at risk. And you can see here the Coast Guard again, the Greek Coast Guard creating waves to push people back to Turkey. Again, an extremely dangerous setting where these are not seaworthy vessels. They're often overcrowded, further putting people's lives at risk. So it's uh, undeniable that this is happening at this point. Um, we've collected testimonies from 
uh, dozens of, of people who've uh, been survivors of, of dozens of push pushbacks over the past uh, two years. And we've found that there's a consistent uh, modus operandi that's happening throughout the Aegean, from the northern Aegean to as far away as Crete Island, um, which is an indication that this is not just uh, uh, random occurrences, that this is a, a practice that uh, must have been approved from, from higher um, authorities. Um, in every case, uh, the end result is that people are abandoned at sea on, on life rafts which don't have mortars, or in the damaged dinghies uh, that people were attempting to cross on, with no means uh, to, to uh, man their boats, to, to sail, to, to land, um, reliant on, on rescue, often from the Turkish Coast Guard. Along with this, as I mentioned before, uh, people's belongings are often stolen, and this includes not only uh, people's mobile phones, um, but also often people's identity documents. Um, further uh, complicating and making more difficult for, for people to, um, to find recourse um, and accountability for this crime against them. Um, and throughout the years, not only by Legal Center Lesbos, but by other actors, um, there's been a consistent participation, not only of the Greek Coast Guard, but also the Greek police, of armed and mass commandos who are clearly uh, operating either with or um, uh, as part of or in very close collaboration with the Greek Coast Guard and police. Uh, Frontex and NATO uh, vessels have also been documented to have participated or at least been aware of pushbacks when they're happening, um, of a pushback that happened in June of 2020. You can see the small migrant boat on the right-hand side um, and two Greek Coast Guard vessels and what could be a Turkish Coast Guard vessel um, in white in the um, upper left-hand corner. Um, what has also increased in the last two years is that people have not only been attacked and pushed back at sea, but that people have been arrested and pushed back even after they arrive on the Greek islands. Um, so here's the documentation of, of one case in Simi Island uh, of a boat that landed in March 2020. So we know that this practice was happening at least since March 2020. Um, this again are photos of individuals on the life rafts. Um, and here you can see Simi Island, it's in the southern uh, Aegean, very close to the Turkish coast. Um, so it's uh, beyond, um, uh, the evidence is clear that this is happening. And as Christina mentioned, uh, it's, it's clear that these are violations of international law. It almost seems um, uh, redundant to have to go through this because abandoning people at sea, attacking them and abandoning them at sea is, is clearly uh, a violation of, of the law. Um, but just to go through it very quickly, um, there are many international instruments that say it's illegal to, to deport people without allowing them access to, to any sort of immigration procedure. Um, and then through, throughout the international conventions and also Greek law, uh, this is also clearly in violation of, of many different uh, principles of law. Um, I'm going through this quickly because uh, it's, I think it's more important to talk about what we can do about this. It's clear this is happening, clear that it's not legal, um, and yet two years later, it's still happening on a daily basis. Um, so just to go through a few examples of, of what we've done at the Legal Center, um, we've presented so far five cases at the European Court of Human Rights um, in representation of, of people who have survived pushbacks. Um, in December of 2021, uh, we saw some progress where 32 cases that have pre been presented, two of which were presented by the Legal Center Lesbos, advanced to the next stage. Uh, what this means is that the European Court of Human Rights has acknowledged that there's uh, somehow enough evidence for the court to examine, examine the case, and they've asked the Greek government to respond to the evidence presented against them. We expect that the Greek government will respond uh, within a month unless, unless they're given an extension and that there could be a decision on these cases uh, by um, the beginning of the summer or perhaps, perhaps later, depending on 
uh, different delays in the procedure that could happen. Um, this is a significant step. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, um, indicative that the court advanced all of these cases at the same time um, and have taken a decision to, to advance cases specifically against Greece for, for pushbacks that are happening. Um, so we're hopeful that uh, we can see a ruling um, happen this year against Greece. Um, but at the same time, uh, of course, uh, we would like to see accountability for the violence that people have suffered, um, but it would be better if, if we can prevent pushbacks from happening. This is the ultimate goal. Um, we've also seen some success in, in, in legal terms in the last months. Um, with the European Court of Human Rights, we've presented uh, now two um, emergency petitions, which are interim measures. So this is a petition you can make if there's an imminent risk of a serious violation of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, you can make a petition to the courts, which then has to be decided um, very quickly, often within 24 hours. So we've presented now two, two cases on behalf of individuals who had arrived in Lesbos um, and who wanted to seek asylum, but were afraid of being pushed back. Um, we've presented two cases that were granted. So the court um, ordered Greece to protect these individuals' uh, rights. Um, and these individuals in the cases we filed were eventually uh, registered in Greece um, and have applied for asylum here. Some are now have actually received refugee status. Um, now, two years after we've seen this practice happening in Lesbos, UNHCR also has started to be more vocal um, about their own documentation of this happening. So we hope this will also lead to, to changes in the practice. Um, uh, so just a little bit more information on the one of the cases we presented with the European Court um, was for a pushback of around 200 people from near Crete Island, um, which was uh, very well documented, not only by the legal center, but also uh, the individuals on board contacted other organizations at the time. There was local media coverage um, of the ship that was, that was basically caught in a storm near Crete, um, and also other organizations uh, published at the time about, about the ship. So we're hopeful that this, this case will go forward successfully. Um, and this is just a, a quote from the decision of the court, which, um, which ordered the Greek government to provide the individuals who had landed with uh, adequate food, water, clothing, um, et cetera, when they had landed. Um, but at the same time, I think it is, while we have seen these advance, advancements, I think it's uh, important to, to note that this, the practice is still happening. Um, we know a pushback that likely happened even yesterday of, of a group of people that landed on Lesbos. Um, there's currently a group of people who have arrived on the island who have not yet been re uh, registered, who arrived early this morning, um, who are probably in hiding still, uh, attempting to, to register their asylum claims um, and attempting to ensure that they will not be pushed back. Um, so this is a very, uh, the reality on the island is, is one in, in which we, we still don't, we're not able to protect and guarantee people's ability to, to not be pushed back. The response of the Greek government, um, as Christina mentioned, continues to be that the pushbacks are not happening. This is a quote of an official response by the Greek government to the European court. Um, when the European court asked Greece to respond to the allegations of pushbacks, which were presented in one of our petitions. And you can see that they continue to deny that it's happening. At the same time, um, also as Christina mentioned, uh, the ability of people to, to monitor and to try to prevent pushbacks from happening and document that they're happening uh, is hindered by the continued criminalization of, of people who are trying to do so. Um, We've seen that uh, there's been public statements, not only by local police, but also by um, high levels of the, of the Greek government, um, uh, accusing or insinuating um, that people who are monitoring pushbacks or reporting about pushbacks are themselves involved in, in smuggling um, or are agents of the Turkish state, which makes it difficult for, for people to, 
um, to mobilize and to react. Um, and this has also um, been hindered uh, by the pandemic, which for the first months um, after the borders were closed, after this practice, uh, we started to document that this practice was happening. Uh, people were also restricted in movement uh, on the island because of COVID measures. So uh, people were no longer free even to, to move around the island uh, to, in order to monitor that this was, was happening. Um, in summary, um, yes, yeah, so this continues to happen. The pushbacks are continuing to happen in a context where Greece has been gradually eroding the rights of migrants uh, with the full support, political and financial, of, of the European Union. Um, and this has been because this has been the political aim of the European Union. Um, there is still no safe and legal route to migration. Um, from the global south, and I mention this also because I think it's important to mention that following the Russian uh, aggression against Ukraine, uh, within a few days, the Ministry of Migration provided for uh, a temporary protected status for Ukrainian nationals, which would allow for entry um, and temporary residency for any Ukrainian na national, which shows that when there is a political will, it is possible for, for people to have a safe way to, to migrate. Um, I wanna leave some time for questions. So we'll wrap up here, um, but uh, you can find more information. I think some of these links have already been shared, um, but I'm happy to send them as well. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so now we have time for some questions and answers. If anyone has any questions, put them in the Q&A box in the bottom right corner. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, can the European Court of Human Rights stop pushbacks? I mean, the easy answer is no. Um, <laughs> the European Court of Human Rights as well uh, this is uh, one limitation of international law in general, is that often international law is, is a soft law, meaning that it's not entirely enforceable. Um, there's no international enforcement body that can, that can uh, force Greece to, to do what the court says even. Um, what we have seen is that, um, I mean, what we hope is that if there is a ruling against Greece from the European Court of Human Rights, um, that this would be a strong indication to Greece that it, it, it should change its policy. Um, what what uh, um, the European Court does, it will rule in a specific case. So in the cases we brought, what they would rule is that yes, there was a violation of these individuals' rights in this specific case when they were pushed back from Greece to Turkey. So they're not making a, a general uh, decision on, on the policy as it's happening. They're making an individual decision in these cases. Um, but of course, this would be a strong, a strong statement coming from the European Court um, if this were decided against Greece. Um, we've seen that Greece uh, is one of the countries that does tend to try to follow what the European Court of Human Rights says. Um, last year, was it was two years ago, the Greek uh, government even nominated the European Court of Human Rights for a uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So there is, a, there is a hope that the Greek government would listen to what the European Court says. Um, and of course, uh, litigation in alone, it's never, um, never alone can, can change policy. Of course, it has to be in combination with um, with other movements that are trying to stop this policy. Um, and I think also the campaign to stop pushbacks cannot uh, happen in isolation. I think it's important to look at pushbacks in the broader context of migration policies um, if we hope to, to see changes. I don't know if that answers the question or Christina has something to add. Like in, in addition like to the last thing that you said, uh, pushbacks also we witnessed this recently in in the borders of uh, Belarus, if I'm not wrong, or something like this. So somehow there is a practice that goes around Europe uh, itself, and it can escalate 
in any case, I mean, any environment that uh, is needed uh, or also the government takes a turn towards more right-wing policies, etc. And the other thing is that probably, usually, the, there are some consequences after like a European court or something like this, or a decision uh, like this, that has to do with fundings as well, etc. So it might make a turn or change the situation also with uh, these kind of uh, decisions. Yes, and, and just to add on that, in the specific cases of the emergency petitions we've done, which are to try to prevent the pushbacks in the moment when someone is at risk of being pushed back, um, we have have seen a shift in the court in the language they're using in the first petition we filed, which was in September, October of, of 2021, and in the, the, um, the case we filed in February of this year in which the court uh, in, in February, they, they granted the interim measure in terms of ordering Greece to ensure that these individuals' rights were not, would not be violated. Uh, in February, they went a step further and asked Greece to respond to the allegations of the pushbacks and seemed to take more seriously the, the allegations and um, somehow tacit acknowledgement that this is, this is a, become a policy in Greece. Um, so hopefully this also is an indication that um, in these individual cases, it's, uh, we don't know if, you know, the decision in the court is what led these people not to be pushed back, um, but we hope that this also helps. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, next question um, is, did the pushbacks begin as a result of the EU-Turkey deal, or did they happen in Greece before that? They happened in Greece before that. Um, Christine also mentioned this at the, the beginning, that these have been documented for years, um, re with reports going back. Uh, the, so I think the first report that I think uh, I'm aware of, it was uh, from 2008 as well. Um, like back in time, it was a very huge gathering, uh, actually, demo in in Lesbos Island, like from people from all around Europe. And basically there were two demands on this uh, to uh, 2009, actually, this took place. The one, it was like the two for the previous detention center, Pagani, to be closed. And the second one is to stop pushbacks, which have also witnessed at this time, but they were doing in a different way. Um, and not so systematically, I think, that we are witnessing somehow now. Uh, but yes, it's it has been done also before. Yeah, and just the kind of two main changes to the practice that we've seen, not since the EU-Turkey deal, but from March of 2020, is one, uh, the use of these life rafts uh, and basically abandoning people at sea in in motorless uh, life rafts and to the pushing back of people after they reach land, after they're reaching the Greek islands. Um, and I am, didn't talk about this a lot because I didn't, I wanted to leave time for questions, but the reality in now is that when people arrive to the islands, they're no longer feel safe. You know, they've just made this traumatic journey across the sea, they arrive on land. And now because of this systemic practice of pushbacks, people are forced to hide in the woods try to reach the camp or reach uh, organizations, um, get legal assistance and um, reach the camp without being pushed back. Um, and they remain in, in a, a, a state of, of terror. Uh, they're, they're essentially hiding in the woods, afraid of being hunted and attacked by masked commandos um, who, who then uh, abandon them at sea. I mean, it's, it's difficult to put in words really the horror and cruelty of what's happening here. And I think also like we are talking about again kidnapping, that uh, it's on the borders of uh, kidnapping people, disappearing people, etc. And we, we didn't mention this at all because today we're focusing also on the Aegean, but this is also a practice that's been happening for years in the land border along the Evros River um, in between uh, Turkey and Greece. So 
for years, this practice of, of people being hunted, attacked, kidnapped, and uh, essentially thrown across the border um, has been happening for years, also in the Everest region in the north, with much less uh, documentation um, and uh, much more difficult access to, to be able to monitor what's happening there. But this, this, there's also been consistent reports of this, this happening in that region for years. Okay, two questions from Jamal. The first one, will you share your slides? Um, I think it should be possible to send to the participants today. Um, yeah. The second question is, what is Frontex? <laughs> Frontex is the European, um, it's a, an entity of the European Union um, for monitoring and enforcing uh, border policies to put it in a short um, in a short way, which has been increased. Um, I brushed over this very briefly, but they've also increased their presence significantly in Greece following uh, March, basically in February 2020, they increased their funding and presence both in the Aegean and in the northern border of Greece with uh, Turkey. In a broader scale, and with um... It's not exactly that it is also, it's something in between an independent organization, which is also cooperates with European Union and at some point controlled by European Union, but not exactly at the same time. There isn't this gray zone about what Frontex is. It's not exactly a task force of European Union, but is in cooperation with, which makes it more blurry the, the role that they do have in the, in the sea. Okay, I'll try to combine a couple of questions. Um, has there been any substantial political reaction against this in Greece? And what acts can people do in Europe and elsewhere to hold Greece and the EU accountable for this? Well, I think I'll, I'll start with, yeah. uh, with this. I think the, um, the reactions somehow in Greece uh, about it, about pushbacks, I mean, um, it has been quite low compared to the severeness and the seriousness of the situation. Uh, but we see that the last month, somehow this topic is uh, open at least to um, either individuals or uh, organizations, or somehow um, it raises a question like that everybody should take a position about it. You cannot deny it anymore. Either you are pro or against. And like the last months, we somehow saw this dynamic uh, somehow growing, not in the level that uh, we all hope to, like to have a serious um, reaction into this or a strong one from the, let's say, society itself. Uh, but there are many moves, several moves uh, that um, they pinpoint and they work on it, they organize demos, um, like in Athens, in Sidonia Square, um, in Lesbos as well, into several places, in Samos, in Hios. Um, I think for now this is the response at some point. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's also been, it's difficult with so many fronts to fight on, uh, both locally and nationally and internationally. It's, it's difficult also to keep the focus on what's happening in the borders because it's one of many issues of oppression and um, not only migrants, but of, of general population in different sectors of the population. Um, and often it seems here that it's, it's difficult to maintain public attention when it's been happening so consistently for such a long time that it's not somehow news anymore. It's a, um, it becomes difficult to hold hold people's attention. Um, so I think it is important for people to 
um, to keep the reference to, to what's happening in the borders and look at it in the broader context of what's happening uh, with the international in intervention in different countries and the resultant uh, migration patterns um, to look at it in, in a broader picture as well and remember that what's happening people in the borders is connected to these broader, broader policies. And I also like from people uh, from abroad and like outside of Greece, etc. I think it's uh, important to somehow follow those voices that um, they are against pushbacks or at least they try and accordingly advocate uh, issues like in their places, in their countries, uh, in their government, especially if uh, they are members of the European Union, etc. I think this is a contribution somehow into this. Um, two more questions. Uh, what happens to people after they're pushed back? And do you know if people have died while being pushed back? Um, in answer to the second question, yes, um, there have been several reported people who have drowned at sea following being pushed back. Um, there was an extensive investigation uh, by The Guardian and Lighthouse reports a couple of weeks ago, uh, which showed that uh, that people were not only being thrown on these life rafts, but also directly into the sea, uh, which resulted in, in several people uh, being killed. Um, just last week in Lesbos, we saw seven people, uh, the bodies of seven people washed ashore. It's still not clear what happened to them, um, but this is also a result of, of these aggressive border policies and the lack of an ability for people to migrate safely um, and legally. Um, the first question, no, I forgot it. <laughs> what happened to the people mm, when, when they're pushed back? Um, so this varies. Um, the people that we've been in contact with, uh, often they're kept in detention in Turkey for either a shorter or longer amount of time, sometimes up to one or two months in detention in Turkey. And we've also been in contact with people who've further been deported back to their home country. Um, so we are in contact with at least one individual who is deported from Turkey to Syria after being pushed back by Greece, um, which in, in fact shows the, the risk of refoulement or return to a country of origin where someone is, is not safe. Um, so we also know many people who've been pushed back many times. So some people five, seven, dozens of times they've tried to cross and been violently pushed back by Greece. And of course this has uh, long-term uh, traumatic effects on these individuals who face these uh, violent attacks. Um, one question in the chat from Gary, is Frontex accountable to public scrutiny? They are, um, and there was actually a, uh, a task force of the European Parliament that was looking, that, uh, was looking into Frontex's uh, role um, and potential violation of human rights. Um, which uh, came out with a report which unfortunately because it's a was an investigation by the European Parliament with uh, participation across the political uh, spectrum uh, in our opinion was was lacking in terms of its uh, condemnation um, but there continues to be reports that are coming about uh, out uh, against Frontex um, so we hope to continue to pressure them uh, so they are they are respondent to to the European Parliament and to the European Union. Um, there's also been efforts in the European uh, Court of Justice to hold Frontex accountable for their role. Um, but I would would mention that um, there has been a lot of focus internationally on accountability for for Frontex. Um, and yes, there there should be. But uh, at this moment, there is uh, an abundance of evidence that. The Greek Coast Guard, uh, Greek police have, have been involved in, in these pushbacks directly um, and are receiving political and financial support from the European Union. And um, we don't need to wait for evidence against Frontex directly in order to, to push for, for accountability. Uh, 
another question. Does Turkey accept migrants who've been pushed back by Greece? Except, I'm not sure what was meant by accept in the question, um, but for the most part, people who are pushed back by Greece, they are rescued in the end by the Turkish Coast Guard who brings them back to Turkey. Um, what happens to them in Turkey is, as I mentioned before, varies um, according to, well, it's not really clear what, what it varies according to, but uh, some people um, are released from detention, um, access to asylum in Turkey. Um, we don't really have time to go into all of that today, but it's also very difficult, um, especially for non-Syrians. There's a special protected, temporary protected status that Syrians are eligible for, but at the same time, many Syrians are still being deported back from Turkey to Syria. Um, access to asylum for all others is extremely limited. Um, so in terms of if accept is having access to all the protections that should be guaranteed under the Refugee Convention, no. Um, except in terms of refu um, rescuing these people at sea and bringing them back to Turkey, this is happening. Okay, maybe if there's no more questions, um, I'll give it a minute. There was one question about Syriza, which I can respond to, ah. if interest. Uh, ah, what has Syriza done since its defeat to protect migrants? Um, I don't know, Christine also wants to comment on this, but I think in response to this, I also just wanted to emphasize that it was the Syriza government that was in power when uh, the EU Turkey statement uh, was implemented into Greek law. Um, it was Syriza who was in power when the procedures were put into place that made the Greek islands into prison islands um, and set up the whole structure that is still being uh, implemented today. So um, I think uh, we are not really expectant that they have an interest in protecting uh, migrant rights unless it's in their political interest at different moments. Um, but I don't know if Christina want to say more. I don't <laughs> think so, but um, okay, uh, it depends if there is uh, like in their political agenda for now and then to mention also this. They do have a, I mean, they mention this kind of things in, in their states, in their public uh, uh, appearance, etc. But at the same time, it's a bit problematic what Lorraine mentioned that all this uh, telling islands to open their prisons, etc. It was a it was constructed by Syriza government itself. So Okay, I think uh, we're coming up to the end now. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to email them to uh, lesvos at cpt.org. Um, thank you to Lorraine and Christina. And have a good morning for those of you in the US. Good evening for those of you in Europe. And Colombia and Canada, and Colombia I saw. And Canada. Yes. Thank you.